especially when it comes to DTC. You know, I think because it's not a brick and mortar and you can't be face to face with people, I think creating that external cre- connection with customers is so huge. And you can do that through email and SMS, but then we do little things that might take a little bit of time, but I honestly feel like it's part of our brand. Hey everybody, we are back with another Founder Insights episode. And today I have a really special guest because we have Hrog Klebjian, who's the owner at Henry's House of Coffee. And I interviewed Hrog four years ago now for the first time uh, after he sent me an awesome email about the results they were getting with their quiz. And I just wanted to chat with him. And now it's going to be super fun to chat about what's happened the last few years, the ups and downs of COVID and all that kind of stuff. So Hrog, thanks for jumping back on with me. Right on. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. So let's go right to it. We talked last in 2020 and well on air we'll talk last in 2020 but what's been the story arc since then like how have the last four years gone well not four years but three ish years how has that gone what are some of the highlights lowlights and then we can dive into specifics from there yeah i mean it's it's been it's been crazy as you can imagine with the most uh, dtc brands you know pre-covid um we we're doing probably like i don't know four to five hundred orders a month uh we had a good system Things were going well. We had the cafe. Everything was working smoothly. And then when, when uh, I think it was in March when we got shut down, uh, we couldn't accept customers inside the cafe. So that was, at first, it was a real uh, scary situation because, you know, the, the cafe made up about like 65% of our business. And so uh, we were only doing takeout. But I think about a week after the shutdown, you know, I'm sure every small business owner does the same. You know, you look at your sales when you wake up. And it was weird. It was like maybe like three times what I typically do on like a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and basically what happened is, as you're well aware, everybody started buying online because they couldn't leave the house. Uh, so in a, in a way, COVID was a blessing. And, and our current situation was as follows. Stores shut down. We're only doing pickup only. And, you know, my current setup, we had a small little table where we're doing all of our orders. But because... <laughs> Our, our orders started to increase so much, we started packing inside the cafe because we just didn't have the right setup. So in a way, it kind of worked. It was crazy. We had to ramp up on supplies. I had to you know, order more coffee bags and labels and all the things that you take for granted. I remember we had a, do- we had a simple printer. I had to buy a laser printer just to print the labels out faster. You know, all those little things that you don't think of. Um, and we went from doing about four or 500 orders to about 1,500 orders in a month. Uh, so it was, it was fantastic. Uh, I, I describe it like, a like you've got this drug now <laughs> and you're riding high on this drug and it just it doesn't end. It was, it was great. It seemed like from an advertising perspective, email promotion, anything we did worked. It was like a no brainer. Just do it all. Keep going. We, we, I think some, some brands were pushing back cause they weren't aware. I was on the flip side. I was like, just, you know, pump more dollars because I think, we're going to see a lot more people uh, buying online. And that's, that's basically what we saw. And that led all the way through, I would say, probably 2022 when, uh, you know, COVID started to end, things started to open up. And we basically rearranged the area where, we, where we're doing our, our online orders. Um, and in 2023, we were still averaging about 1,200 orders a month. So, you know, still 3x what we were doing pre-COVID. Um, it wasn't at the peak of COVID, which, you know, I think makes makes sense. It's logical. But I think a lot of the work we were doing with the email marketing, the the, the different touch points we're doing, the, the coffee quiz that we have on our website, thanks to your uh, system and your service, um, has really helped customers stay in touch. And so our retention has still been really good. Um, and it's been a blessing because now our online business is about, you know, almost 50% of our overall sales. Um, cafe still doing strong and it's just been a blessing to to have that channel that I've always kind of relied on and, and hope that would grow and see it kind of where it's where it's landed now that's awesome I mean it sounds like it was a lot to figure out all at once though right like I would imagine COVID hits and then you got to set up all these systems like how did you go about 
doing that? Cause this is like a lot of our customers ask this, like, what email should I use and how do I set up ads? Like how yeah. much had you been doing before COVID hit and how much did you have to just like on the fly implement a bunch of stuff? Yeah, I, I think we had a really good foundation. So, um, you know, we, we always had the, the email marketing, the SMS marketing. We had ShipStation we used for process. Order. It was just the volume all of a sudden created kind of a chaos. But then another thing happened that uh, we transitioned to, we were on WooCommerce. And, you know, I've always been following up in the industry, you know, Shopify being the number one place. Uh, and so when things kind of settled down in 2021, we actually switched from WooCommerce to Shopify. And then we also switched our email marketing from MailChimp to Klaviyo. And I felt like WooCommerce was fantastic. MailChimp was great. But kind of for, for me, I felt like the next level were these two changes, having the Shopify and having Klaviyo. Klaviyo specifically, just on the simplicity of the integration, um, all the additional flows, as they call it, that we were able to generate. And then Shopify, every single app that was something that I needed was always launched first on Shopify. And I felt like that was the platform that I needed to be on. Um, and so we did that kind of at the, we were, I think we were still in pseudo COVID, but that was in 2021 when, when I have a, when I had a good cadence and I felt like that was the right time to switch over. Um, and then the other big one was, uh, the subscription products that we sell. So we were on WooCommerce. Uh, I think it was called like Woo subscriptions and we switched over to recharge. So, uh, since we have the, the right cadence, the kind of, I, I got a good sense of what our monthly flow was coming in at. I had good staff, uh, inventory was good. I felt like that was the next logical step for me. Um, and we, we switched, I think it was in April of 21. And it's funny, like we immediately saw an increase in uh, like the overall conversion rates. You know, Shopify is known for their checkout. I think it's one of, it's the best. Uh, so we did see like a percentage uptick in that. But I felt like that was the next logical step for kind of like my business um, and, and an online presence to switch over to. Yeah, I noticed that you had implemented subscriptions is that like something that you push a lot like what percentage or how big yeah. of a business line is that for you it, it is something we push i think with coffee it makes sense especially yeah. since people typically drink like a pound of coffee a month or so um it's about 20 percent of our business i'm not sure what the industry benchmark is I've, I've read some things like it's in the teens so i think we're a little bit um on the higher end which is great uh one of the other things that we just tried out a uh, month ago is when you visit one of our product detail pages, uh, the default option is set for subscriptions instead of a one-time purchase. Uh, we offer like a 5% off for subscribing. Um, and then we also offer um, uh, free shipping if, if you get, uh, if you spend $30 or more on a subscription, whereas if you buy one time, the free shipping is 45. So try to incentivize the customers to try that out. Um, Recharge has been fantastic. I'm not, not sure, Josh, if, if you're familiar with them. Um, but their, you know, their user experience is really good. You, there's so much customization you can do. But also from the customer's end, you know, you can pause your subscription. You can add one-time items. You can change your frequency. So it just makes it really easy for them to feel comfortable signing up for something that's automatically going to be shipped. I think that's like their biggest fear when it comes to subscribing. Yeah, totally. I, I'm familiar with it. And that, that makes a lot of sense. I think there was like this huge subscription wave and then everybody got kind of over it and now it's starting yeah. to come back and you have to be very careful with making sure you give the customer complete control. Um, yeah. Something I wanted to dive into more, cause at least from my perspective, you kind of brush over these things, but I think you're really good at it actually. Cause I came to see your setup, your packaging setup. And I was like, this is very efficient. Like, it's yeah. not a huge space, but you have everything very much like efficient, both from a movement perspective. Like you were even telling me about like, oh yeah, we set this up so that people don't have to move and you can just go in order and we can pack very efficiently. And then as you're talking about like the online systems, same thing. I'm hearing a lot of like, it's optimized. Yeah. Is that, is, do you have a background in like operations? Is it just from years of experience with this business? Because I talk to a lot of small businesses where that's a huge pain point. Like yeah, optimization yeah. and systems and processes are not like the bread and butter. Yeah. You know, I come from a finance background. Uh, so from a finance perspective, you know, our 
I would say our biggest cost is labor. So as, 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 as much as I can keep the labor down or keep it efficient, that's the number one goal. But I think from a personality perspective, like me personally, I'm always a very efficient person. Like, um, for example, when I go to buy gas or when I'm checking out at the grocery store, I'm always using my Apple watch because it's just so fast and quick and easy. And so my brain is always like, how can I make this easier? Um, and so I've tried to implement that a lot in my shop. I also watched a movie, Josh, I don't know if you saw that. It was called The Founder, about the, the founder of McDonald's. Did you ever see that on Netflix? Yeah. I also yeah. read the book. It's really good. Yeah. And when I watched that, I, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't eye opening. I think it was more just justifying what I need to keep kind of squeezing out of the, you know, you talked about movements and they mentioned that in the movie. And so for me, um, I wanted to make it a comfortable for the employees, but be able to process it as efficient as possible. It takes us about two minutes and 45 seconds per product, like per bag of coffee from uh, printing the labels to packing it, sealing it, and then putting it in the actual shipment. So two minutes and 45 seconds. And so I've been able to track all that stuff and then also track, you know, how long does it take to prep the coffee? How long does it take to put it in the shipping labels and all those kind of breakdowns. So I could see where there might be some efficiencies because again, it's, if you can keep your labor down, uh, or, or sorry, the other way around, if you can do, uh, if you can process more with the same number of labors, labor hours, then your overall cost per product is going to be less. And so um, that's always been something that I've really focused on. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's also better ways to do it, but the space is what confines us. And I think in the future, if I get to a place where we could physically move a location, we could pump it out even faster. But right now I'm limited in space. So um, I love it. It's not my background. I think it's just like a personality thing. I think it's so cool. I mean, I was I was very inspired when I came to visit. I was like, this is this is cool. Like you have the online component, but it still has that very tangible like we're putting a product that's made with a lot of thought and care into physical bags and we're shipping it to people. There's a connection in that way. I think that's super cool. Yeah, especially when it comes to DTC, you know, I think because it's not a brick and mortar and you can't be face to face with people. I think creating that external connection with customers is so huge. And you can do that through email and SMS, but then we do little things that might take a little bit of time, but I honestly feel like it's part of our brand. So an example is anytime somebody places an order, we always include three uh, pieces of sesame candy. Sesame candy is made out of honey and sesame seeds that are toasted. And it's like a crunchy candy. And the story behind that is that when my dad started the business, um, you know, buying, buying bags of coffee was unique at the time. And so my father would always give them, give the customer three pieces of candy kind of as a thank you for coming to my store. Cause he treated it like family, like thanks, basically thank you for coming to my house. And I wanted a way to kind of emulate that. And so, yeah, it's, it costs me money. It's not a big amount of money. It also costs me time because we got to put, three pieces in there, not four, but three to represent the three generations of coffee heritage. Uh, and we follow that up with an email anytime it's a new customer to explain to them why you're getting a random three piece of candy. But I think that's what creates and resonates with these customers because they feel like it wasn't just a transaction. They see my order. They know that I'm a new customer and they're including this thing. Um, I, I think that th those little things are so important when you're trying to create and grow a brand, especially when they can't relate, I mean, uh, talk to you face to face. Those things are uh, kind of the key or cornerstone of what businesses should be doing. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, that's what I was going to be my next question, but you, know, you explained it even better than I could have asked it because in addition to the process and like the efficiency that I've seen in your business, you also have a very strong storytelling component and, a very strong creative component where, you know, even some of the ads that I've seen that you have on Instagram or Facebook is very well done. And there's a, there's a real story there. It doesn't feel like this is just another D to C brand that is selling the same products as everybody else. Um, do you feel like that comes 
I mean, there's there's obviously a great story behind it, and anybody listening should go check out their website, uh, henryshouseofcoffee.com, and look at the story. It's it's very well laid out there. But is is that where most of that creative inspiration comes from, or do you have an interest also in the creative side of things in addition to like your interest in the process side? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I tell my wife sometimes like, man, I should have gone into like marketing or something like it's mm-hmm. so fun. Um, I think it took time for me to to realize and understand uh, what my brand should be. So when I first started, you know, I was really focused on the operations of the cafe. I wanted to understand how to clean toilets and co- grind coffee, make espressos, all the operational things. But then as I started to have some free time and think about growing the business, the number one thing I wanted, I was thinking about was, well, what, why, why my place? Why Henry's House of Coffee? Um, coffee, as you know, it's ubiquitous. There's probably like new coffee roasters popping out every day. And how do I compete with that? Like what sets me apart? At first I thought, well, it's because I'm, you know, three generations of coffee, which is true. But then as, as I, as I, as I st- started thinking about that, I started thinking about the story of my dad, my grandfather, me, and I wanted to be true to who we, we are as a business. And what I mean by that is when it comes to coffee, the coffee industry, I would say over the last 10, 15 years has started to um, enhance the flavor of what coffee is, which is a cherry. So if you're not familiar, if your folks are not familiar listening to this, coffee is a seed of a cherry. And, and a cherry, just like you know, when we eat it, it's very tart and acidic, slightly sour, slightly sweet. Coffee cherries are the same. Um, and the industry wanted to kind of um, explore that and make the coffee taste like a cherry. Now, if you grew up drinking coffee, that's a really different taste than what you grew up on. The, the, newer, the newer style roasting process, either sweet or floral. Uh, if you've never had it before, your first sip, you might be like, wow, this is like sour, almost like a tea. And so I was thinking like, you know, should I be doing that? A lot of the coffee companies that are winning awards are roasting these like really sweet coffees from Africa. And they're talking about where it's from and the farmer. But it, it, you know, that's, that's not what my dad was doing in the shop. He was, he was, first of all, he was there every day, six days a week. And he was roasting it dark. That's what he was. That's what he learned. And as I started to talk to my dad and customers, they just all the comments were always like, wow, like I can drink this coffee without milk or sugar. Like I never drink it black. This is amazing. And, and so I just thought to myself, I got to be I'm going to feel more comfortable telling a story and marketing myself. If I can be true to what we are, which is we're not your new age coffee roasters. We're old school, traditional kind of classic coffee roaster. And so I started I put the two together, which is you know, family history of coffee roasting. And then for the product itself is we are who we are. We're dark roast. If you like dark roast coffee, doesn't mean we don't do the other stuff. But if you're a fan of that and you grew up drinking coffee, you're going to have to want to try our coffee. There's no other, there's no other uh, second place. So I think it took time. um, And uh, it was also, I wanted to feel comfortable when I was telling these stories and advertise not feel fake. Like you mentioned, I wanted to be real and honest. And so I thought there's no way that I can compete if I'm not being honest, that's gotta be like my Northern star. Mm. That's, that's so true from everything that I've seen. And uh, I, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about interact too. And I'm like, same thing for us. Like there's core competencies, competencies we have, and there's other things that are not our core con- competency and we don't try to do those things. I think that it takes, uh, at least in my experience and from what I've seen, like it takes kind of a trial by fire in a sense to reach that point. Like you mentioned, you know, you try these different things, you want to be this, you want to be that. You kind of have to go through that to reach the point where you're like, you know what, if I'm going to be doing this for a long time, I got to do it as me. Otherwise, this is not going to, this is just not sustainable. And yeah. I yeah. And I think, I think the biggest challenge with, with business owners is saying no, like, you know, you don't want to say no to a customer. You're that's why you're in this business. But my, my, my mindset is not that I'm saying no, what I'm telling them is this is, this is what we offer. If this is not something that you're looking for, I'm happy to, you know, I'm happy to tell somebody 
that they can go to a blue bottle or a ritual um, because it, it's, it builds credibility and honesty. And, you know, it's word of mouth. Like if they, if they felt honest about it, maybe they tell their friend, hey, oh, you like dark roast? I, I reached out to this company. They literally recommended somebody else because it wasn't a fit, but maybe you might like them. Like, I just feel like that's a value that businesses need. And it's, you know, it's wanting to do that sale is a short-term thing. If you're thinking long-term of, you know, building your brand and being who you are, you're going to get those sales. It's just going to take a little bit more time. Um, it's like the, uh, it's like a, like a marathon in a sense. And so I'm okay saying no, because I feel really confident in, in what I am and what I'm not. So. Yeah. I've, I think I've literally seen that in one of your reviews. I think somebody, maybe it was a Google review. Somebody said they literally referred me to somebody else, but that was like the best experience I've ever had at a coffee shop. And yeah. That yeah. really jumped out at me because you're totally right. It's like a short term versus long term mindset. And the thing that I always say with that is like a short term mindset is a long term mindset. It's just a short term mindset where you're going to try a new thing every five days. Yes. Yeah. Is like actually do the same thing for a long time. And at the end of the yeah. day, you're still going to spend five years doing it. It's just like, do you want to stand for something or do you want to just chase things and make that your identity? And yeah, I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> it's better to just choose one. Yeah. And, uh, agreed. Stick with that. Uh, what are your plans? Like, what do you, you mentioned maybe eventually having like a separate facility. Like, is that on your mind? Like, are you trying to continue scaling? Like what's, what's the thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think right now I'm not there yet. I probably would have to grow by like another 30% or so for me to justify justify it right now what we're really focused on is uh scaling our ads you know we, we're mainly advertising on meta facebook instagram uh scaling those keeping a close track on what that acquisition cost looks like and what the lifetime value is kind of adding up to um and then slowly we're, i'm also looking into uh, doing a little bit of wholesale i think i think there's some opportunities in the bay area specifically with businesses that are looking for for local coffee roasters um, and so trying out some, some ads actually, um, targeting, uh, small business owners, real estate firms, accounting firms, right? Like everybody likes to drink coffee, putting a little bit of money behind that to see if that's something that, um, might work because I think wholesale also makes sense up to a certain degree. You know, we're not talking like Pete's level. Um, but if there's these smaller kind of clientele, where they're driving to Costco every week to get coffee, you know, they could do that with us. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at. And then in terms of the cafe, the cafe, you know, it's, that's like my, my cash cow per se, solid, steady, making sure we've got the right staff, always engaging with them, making them feel like this is a different, unique place. Um, like I have, I have a couple employees who are graduating from, from college now. And one of the things I love doing is helping them out with like their resume building, practicing, uh, interview questions, seeing if I can use my network to get them some jobs or internships. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's a, that's a big part of what I love to do in it. And it, and I think it makes them feel like, you know, this is not just a nine to five clock in, like they can rely on, on Harag and the company to help them grow because I think, I think Steve Jobs said something like this, but like, you know, we don't expect you to work here for the rest of your life. Maybe it wasn't Steve Jobs, but when you do work here, we're going to make you the best person. And that's kind of like my mentality. Like when you work at Henry's, you're going to work hard. We're going to teach you some skills and you're probably not going to be a barista for the rest of your life. If you want to, you can, but I'm assuming you have aspirations because you went to college. And so use those skills and then use me as a resource to kind of help you get to where you need to be. That's awesome. I mean, it just makes me want, uh, want it to all work out for you. <laughs> like, yeah, man. It's, uh, great. it's good, man. I can't complain. I'm, 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 I'm blessed. I'm very blessed. Yeah. And I mean, you all have been around for such a long time. I think that's another big part of the, the story that we didn't talk about too much on this one. We talked about it last time, just the longevity of the business. And as you're talking, I'm seeing why that's the case. It's like, it's that long-term mindset. It's investing in people. It's always trying to do the right thing by people, even if that means helping them get a job somewhere else if they were yeah. at your company, or if it means telling them to go to a different coffee shop if that's the right thing for them. And I think it's you know whatever 
kind of thing you subscribe to the broad word that people like to use for that is karma. I think that, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think it is very true. And, um, I mean, also with the foundation that you've built, I feel like it's just a matter of time before those goals do end up happening. And also because your mindset is so long-term, like, I don't hear you saying yeah. like, Oh, if it doesn't happen next year, then we're thrown in the towel. It's like, yeah, it's not. And also, you know, I've, you know, it's, it's a family business. I think, I think for those that work with family, it's, it, it's a totally different mindset. You know, I, I think for me personally, like I don't want to let my dad down and my grandpa down for all the stuff that they built. Uh, my father passed away in 2021 and, um, you know, I don't think I realized it at the time, but when he passed away, I think it hit me a little bit more like, Hey, this is, it's all, it's all on you now, even though I was doing most of the, most of it. Right. But it, I think it was just a, it was just a, a timing thing in my brain where I realized like, you know, I can't pick my dad's brain anymore. Or I can't ask him like, what did you do in 1983 when Costa Rica was out of stock and you have to pick something else, that kind of stuff. So for me, it's like a, a, a bigger motivation, a bigger driver in my office. Uh, when my dad passed away, he used to always wear this like fedora hat. So I've got, I've got that hanging in my office now as a reminder for me, like he's always keeping his eyes on me. It's like a, you know, it's like a visual representation that like, I'm, I'm always going to do what I think my dad would be proud of. Sometimes it's a difficult decision, but I know that my dad would support me and he'd be proud of it. And at the end of the day, like you said, I just want to do the right thing. Sometimes it's okay to say no. Sometimes it's okay to take a loss on something, but I gotta, I gotta sleep well at night knowing that, um, I did my best. And, um, uh, I know that it's a long-term game. Like, like you said, like I plan on being here for like the next 30 years. So that's, yeah. that's my drive. Yeah. That that's so, I mean, just hats off to you. I think, I think it's really cool when, you know, somebody says that, but then also does that and from all of our interactions and everything that you can find online about Henry's like you actually live that out and I think it's it's powerful when you have that kind of accountability uh for lack of a better term I think it's even bigger than that it's like a it's a desire to follow in footsteps or follow a path and I think that's really powerful not just from like showing up in a certain way but also just in terms of like building things i feel like when it has that like kind of that core essence to it it's so much more authentic and genuine and like everything it just shows you know like yeah you can tell when that's there and especially you know we've kind of hit it on it a couple of times but in dt d to c it's like there's always a new brand that has some cool thing and it's yeah. flashy and yeah. odds are it won't be here in six months. And you don't really want to invest in something like that. But then when you have that authenticity and the genuine kind of North Star, like you were saying earlier, I, I think that's that's really, really rare. <laughs> like especially Thanks, man. Space. Yeah, I know. It's uh it's great. And I and I love talking to other small business owners that have taken on like their parents' shop or whatever it is because they go through the same exact stuff. And I feel like we're all a big family from that perspective and if there's anything I can do to help them or get some ideas like it just makes me feel like I'm a part of something bigger, you know. Yeah. And I mean that at least from my perspective, it's like it's kind of a lost art of like carrying on a tradition and building something over multiple generations i feel like doesn't doesn't always carry through in that way and so when it does it's really special and unique it's yeah cool man thanks that. it's cool to see yeah um, i'm glad i'm glad things are going good in terms of like so ads was one that you mentioned um what have you found that works well like do you have hunches right now of like how you're going to reach that next level are there certain aspects that are standing out of like this type of ad format is right. We just have to dial it in or where are you at with that? I think when it comes to, when it comes to ads, I'm more, I work with an agency and I think what I found is there's a lot of art and science behind it. And what I, what I mean by that is the art side is the kind of the, the, the test ads that will start to generate, you know, you'll create like five or 10, 
designs of just assumptions that you think might work, whether that's like a, like a static photo, whether that's a comparison ad, whether it's a lifestyle video, whatever it may be. Um, and we'll test that out for about a week. We'll, we'll look at some metrics to see which one's performing well, whether it's a, you know, the cost per acquisition, the number of impressions or clicks. We'll turn the other ones off. We'll boost the money to that one. And then we'll create and generate five to 10 new ones. So it's like never ends. And I, and I tell small business owners that all the time. I'm like, look, if you want to go into advertising, you got to set up a good amount of budget because it's, you just can't like, like set it and forget it, especially if you want to scale. And that's where we're at. You know, we're trying to scale. Um, right now we're, we're getting about $42 uh, a cost per acquisition, which is a, what I call a blended CAC, which includes the fees that I'm paying my, my agency. Um, and you know, that's an easy calculation for small business owners to do, figure out how much they spent and how much they're spending monthly and, you know, figure out how much you owe. So, but I think the part that they miss is the, the lifetime value that we talked about. If it's a product that you're able to sell more than once, you are not, you know, we're not talking about a mattress here, then there's so many apps out there that can tell you what that lifetime looks like based on a cohort, especially if you have Shopify, there's an app called lifetime leads, freaking awesome. Um, and you can take a look at that and say like, Hey, over the past two years, you know, what is that lifetime value bringing in? And for us, it's about 185 bucks. You throw away about 50% with, for cost of goods and all that stuff. And so we're about 90 ish bucks within two years. So my thought is if it costs me 42 bucks and in two years I can bring in 90, that's a great return on investment. The downside is it's going to take me two years, but again, long-term, right? We're not, I'm not here to like make a quick buck. Um, and so that's what I find when, when it comes to advertising is just keeping that cost per acquisition around the 40 bucks. And then every so often, probably like once a quarter, looking at what that lifetime value is looking like, where it's trending um, and just doing more of the same. I think the challenge is whenever you're increasing your budget, that's when, cause, cause you're getting the lower hanging fruit in the beginning. And so the more you spend, the harder it becomes. And so the short answer is there is no, like, there's no like shortcut. You got to do a lot of testing. You got to have a lot of money to do the testing. Uh, believe in your product and, and keep keeping an eye on whether you feel like those those ads are working or not. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I was we were thinking about doing uh, uh, what's it called? YouTube. Google has this thing. Josh, you might know better than me. I forget what they call it, but it's like they'll put it on YouTube. They'll put it on ad ad words and blah blah blah. Oh, the performance max. Thank you. Yeah. I always forget that name. I always yeah, think yeah. of like Nike Air, Nike Air Max. Yeah, yeah. sound like that. Um. But I will say, I think over the last year, Facebook has figured out kind of the iOS update issue, and they've gotten really good at figuring it out, and we're seeing much better results now. So we, we're not really focused a lot on Google as much anymore. We're really hyper-focused on on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think for anybody listening, this is a great reminder that it is all about that experimentation. It's like yeah, you can't. You know, the number of conversations where I talk to a small business owner and they're like, ah, oh, I tried an ad and it didn't work. I'm like, yeah, okay, try 400 more and then. Yeah, that. right. <laughs> then yeah. talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so tough, especially when, you know, you're talking about spending in the beginning, maybe like a thousand bucks a month. Like that can be a lot of money for people. And that's actually not a lot of money to test ads. And I understand that. So I always tell small business owners like, okay, that's great. If you want to get into advertising, I would set aside 5,000 bucks first. So, you know, however long that takes you to kind of set it aside, set that aside. And then that's your kind of pool of money. That'll take you about two to three months max. And then after that, tell me if it worked or not, because otherwise you're not going to get a good kind of result. So uh, that is challenging. But, you know, one thing that's working pretty well, Josh, uh, plug for your company, Try Interact. Mm. Uh, you know, we've been with you guys for probably like seven years now. And it just kicks a lot of ass. Like the coffee quiz is perfect for what we want to do to represent somebody that wants to have a conversation who doesn't know what they want, or maybe they do know what they want and make a recommendation. And we've done the kind of like the, the banner that pops up from the top uh, that gets great clicks. But now what we're, we're also experimenting with is another app. Uh, have you heard of Tolstoy? Yeah. That's been popping up. What is it exactly? Yeah. Like? So it's basically like they're like founder videos that pop up when you're browsing somebody's website. Yes. And it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a founder video. It's basically just a video that auto plays. Um, 
And what's really cool about Tolstoy is within that video that pops up, if, if a customer clicks on it to see what the video is about, you can add links in that video to further engage with the customer. So one of the, one of the links that we've created is the coffee quiz. So it's a, uh, if you were to go to my website, you'll see me kind of talking in the background. If you click on it, it's a founder video that explains a story. And then it has like our three questions and those are generated based on like feedback from customers that I interact with of like, what are the top questions? So the first one is like, how much coffee should I use? Um, the second one, uh, I forgot what the second one is, but the third one that's on there is take our quiz. And so from there they can, they, that'll take them directly to the interact quiz. And then from there, obviously they can get a, an offering. So it's another way for us to use, try interact in a different way for people to really get a sense of what they're looking for. Um, and so the two work really well hand in hand. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, definitely. Anybody listening is Henry's house of coffee.com. Go check that out. Cause that's a cool setup. I mean, in terms of creating that connection, like you mentioned earlier, where it's like, you're not seeing people in person on the e-commerce site and it's hard to translate over that experience of someone walking into your cafe and being greeted by you or someone on your team who is a friendly face and can talk to them. Um, yep. So be able to have that video and then also be able to have the quiz that kind of emulates that same experience where it's like, what, what should I get? Like, which of these is going to be right for me? That's yeah. Uh, I like that a lot. That's a cool one. Yeah. It's really neat. And I, and I, and I found it from another, you know, small business that I was talking with. And uh, I was like, oh, that's actually great because nobody clicks on the about us anymore or and also nobody really reads anymore. So this is a great way to kind of like tell them right off the bat, like, hey, this is who we are. Uh, so it's cool. It's I love I love tech and it's always, you know, testing it out. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that that's all like super helpful. I mean. I feel like there's so many different nuggets from this episode that we'll have to pull out and put in the, the show notes, but you know, the, from the testing to the perseverance, to the staying on track, to the long-term thinking, to the building relationships, not just for the short-term sale, but for actually creating longevity. Those are all just like businesses. And you, you know, I, not every small business that I, you know, connect with, I connect with again four or seven years later. Right. And I think yeah. those are the reasons why it's like, that's what builds that long-term sustainability. Um, as we wrap things up, a couple of questions that are semi selfish, but um, what's your favorite place to learn or to read or to listen um, to, to learn these things that you're talking about here? Yeah. Uh, one is YouTube, just Googling, Shopify, best Shopify apps or whatever. And that takes you to kind of down the rabbit hole. Another one is a podcast that I listen to. And, um, uh, do you know the, the founder of Sharma brands? No. Oh my gosh. Can I, I was, I was going to, uh, I was going to open up my laptop so I could find it, but basically he has a podcast that he does. Um, and it's, it's two guys. One of them uh, is a founder of Sharma brands. And then the other one is, um, uh, he, he founded a deodorant company and I forget what it was called, but it's a fantastic podcast. Maybe after this podcast, uh, I can email you the link. Yeah, yeah I'll put um, it in the show notes. And there, I mean, it's like, you know, if you own a DTC, it's a awesome, awesome podcast because they just get really nerdy. They have so much experience. You just pick up little nuggets here and there on every single podcast. So I think between YouTube that, and then, you know, I'm, I'm on a bunch of newsletters and I feel like, uh, you know, with those, with those three coupled with those three, I'm always getting something out of it. You know what I mean? It's like never ending. Mm, I like that. Okay. Here's the one that I'm excited to ask you because normally I ask people this and like, you know, they go back a few years, but because you've been doing this so long, if you went back to you when you first jumped into working on the business, like what's your top advice? Like what would you, what would you want to let yourself know about the journey ahead? I think the biggest response I would give to myself is keep focusing on what you're doing. You're going to get there. It's just going to take time. Like just slow down. Because when I first started, I was like, why am I only getting 15 orders a month? It was like cr killing me. And I, I wish somebody told me, look, like you're going to get there. This is not a race. It's a marathon. You're a successful guy. You have a great business. It's going to take time for people 
to recognize who you are and buy from you. Put your head down and keep focusing on it. Because like I was literally looking at stuff like, you know, every day and just getting pissed off. Like, why am I not getting sales? Why am I not getting sales? And um, it's understandable, but I think time is of the essence. Put it, put in the work and be, be patient. Patience, patience, patience is what I would tell myself. That's, <laughs> those are wise words from someone that you can tell has been doing it a long time yeah. and, and has had success. I feel like, I don't know. I mean, if it, if you hadn't had that progression, then I don't know. I think that would carry less weight, you know, like somebody yeah. that says that, but hasn't like built something. It's like, okay, whatever. But because you've actually yeah. built this thing, it's like, it's very, I think everybody needs to hear that. At least yeah. Today. <laughs> we need that in life in general, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Man, well, thanks for jumping back on. This is super fun to catch up after a few years. And uh, we'll have to have you back on in like another couple of years just to hear the next update. So, Hey, I love that, Josh. And, and again, kudos to you too. You've, it sounds like you guys have been doing a fantastic job there. So proud of hearing all the updates on LinkedIn and your growth. Uh, so kudos to you as well, my friend. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>